Hello and welcome to the program. So the United Nations International Court of Justice in The Hague recognized its jurisdiction in the case of Ukraine versus Russia. Uh, the Russian Federation had raised five preliminary objections and all five were overruled, uh, with the court saying its judgment is final and cannot be appealed. So what results will this decision bring to Ukraine? I'm uh, pleased to say here to discuss this, we welcome to our studio Taras Simpurivsky. He is the head Head of USAID Human Rights in Action Programme. Hi, Taras. Thank you very much for coming in to uh, speak about this. Good evening. Thank you for having me. So this was a huge uh, decision, huge victory for Ukraine in the international court against Russia. But um, can you tell us um, how significant is it? Indeed, it was a milestone in international litigation of Ukraine against Russian Federation in terms of this case and other ongoing cases, uh, especially in terms of European Court of Human Rights, International Criminal Court. Uh, the outcome uh, of uh, this decision, which was delivered last Friday, is that Ukraine has uh, broke, broke through the jurisdictional phase. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not the first time, actually, the court looked into the issue of jurisdiction, namely back in 2017 when Ukraine uh, instituted proceedings against Russian Federation. It also requested for in, in, in indicating uh, provisional measures uh, for the court in order to substantiate its claims uh, with regard to Russian Federation and approximately in half a year court delivered such a decision and it recognized prima facie uh, jurisdiction that is preliminary jurisdiction and leaving the other side of jurisdiction for the uh, next stage which took place recently and in this very case uh, the court addressed the issue of uh, material ju jurisdiction. Mm. That, that is why he evaluated how the claims of Ukraine uh, if were or were not within the scope of two conventions. Let me remind you that these were two conventions which enabled Ukraine to trigger uh, its uh, litigation against Russian Federation, since in international law there is no a single court to deliver the decision and to find a proper solution to all the issues. Yeah. These were the first ones, the uh, convention on the uh, elimination of all the forms of racial discrimination, mm -hmm. and the other is on suspension of financing terrorism. And, and there was a slight fear that perhaps uh, the one on financing terrorism wasn't going to be um, in the jurisdiction of this court. Is, is that right? Uh, this was actually one of the caveats which was expressed in the ex within the experts actually mm. before the decision was delivered as such, namely that up to this day the court didn't have the proper uh, any single case uh, actually uh, in terms of uh, a convention uh, on um, suppression of financing terrorism. Mm -hmm. This was the first point. And the other point that terror terrorism as such is a very sensitive issue, mm -hmm. often uh, is a mixture of political and other uh, issues. And that's why uh, it was like a large uh, victory for Ukraine in overall uh, when we had like uh, a decision which was uh, successful for Ukraine. And tell me, what happens next? now that the court has said it does have jurisdiction in this case. So on the next stage uh, of this very litigation, the court will look directly into the merits of the case, namely the issues which were raised by Ukraine in terms of the aforementioned uh, conventions. conventions uh, for example, when it refers to the convention of the uh, eradication of all forms of racial discrimination, this was the very convention invoked by Ukraine in terms of the situation in Crimea. And that is Ukraine alleges that uh, there is an ongoing systematic uh, policy of oppression of Ukrainian uh, citizens as well as Crimean Tatars, mm. which are dissent uh, with the policy of Russian Federation uh, and its annexation of Crimea, and which uh, is emanating from uh, the uh, harassment uh, and intimidation of these very people. Mm. And Ukraine uh, gives proper examples of abductions, killings, uh, and torture. Rishata Mato, for example, mm. uh, this was one of the first cases. The other thing uh, which could be uh, invoked is uh, 
the uh, usage of anti anti extremist uh, legislation mm -hmm. in, in order to persecute uh, which they have done yeah, yeah. To, to, in order to persecute these people and also retroactive uh, application of criminal code of Russian Federation for the events for example of 26th of February uh, 2014 the mm -hmm. dem demonstration in support of Ukraine's territorial integrity and a lot of like instances which prove uh, the fact that this is the pattern of behavior which is very purposeful in order to intimidate all these people which are not uh, uh, which are dissenting with uh, the policy of Russian Federation in contrast uh, the other convention on suppression of financing terrorism it is uh, upheld by Ukraine's allegations of uh, using uh, heavy weapons in order to uh, shell uh, civilians and civilian objects and among these instances Ukraine has picked uh, some of the most severe ones mm. of course not all of them this is the shelling of Avdiivka, Mariupol, Volnovakha, Kramatorsk uh, and also down in uh, MH17 Malaysian Airlines and also some of the examples which uh, um, prove uh, some bombing in the cities which are not very close to the contact line uh, with uh, LNR and DNR. Mm. Uh, um, uh, these unlawful uh, entities and uh, they are recalling some instances of Kharkiv, so-called Kharkiv partisans which yeah. are affiliated to Russian Federation who was financing supposedly them. Uh, on the general scale uh, Ukraine asserts that Russian Federation used its territory in order to finance and to provide funds to the entities and its proxies which were engaging which which were waging war uh, against Ukraine through providing funds through providing providing weapons and through uh, exerting control over the border uh, with so-called LNR-DNR. Yeah. So really this uh, particular case um, involves every part of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. It's not really limited to uh, one particular instance such as the MH17 uh, tragedy or human rights in Crimea. Uh, before we move on, it'd be good to talk about the, the time scale and the process of uh, the, the case. Uh, we have a quote uh, from the Deputy Foreign Minister Olana Zokol, who uh, spoke uh, in The Hague after the hearing. So we can have a listen. Yeah. Regarding the Boeing, it was an extremely important decision because, in fact, it means that Russia will be brought to justice and that it will be obliged to try to justify its actions in the International Court for bringing weapons to Ukraine and for everything that followed. That the court and the international community will see what transpired. They will have access to all the files. Moreover, this may influence the matter regarding the creation of a tribunal in the frameworks of the UN Security Council. I am very grateful to all of you. Today we had a truly great victory. So there we go, that was Olena Zakharov speaking there. Um, now, obviously Russia must have to make its case. And as you mentioned in the, the examples, the shelling of uh, Mariupol, uh, Avdivka, uh, MH17, there's a lot of evidence that Ukraine has that could be used in this case. So what exactly does Russia have to do now uh, in its arguments? Do you think it will, um, you know, give the usual sort of propaganda lines or what sort of arguments could they use even to avoid accountability? Uh, at rough guess, actually, I would presume that this would be a mix of arguments, so-called arguments, artificial ones, of course. It would be one part related to propaganda when uh, Russian Federation is using course to disseminate some misleading information in terms of what is in fact going on in Ukraine in order to spread false messages to the people who are living abroad. And this is uh, a perfect arena to use and to leverage on the side of Russian Federation. Some like things actually took place uh, in terms of the last litigation, oral hearings which took place uh, within the European Court of Human Rights and I would presume that this would be the case for the International Court of Justice and from the, on the other hand of course uh, Russian Federation would use some uh, loopholes of international law in order to confuse judges but uh, 
it wouldn't work as such, I would presume, because they have seen so many different cases in, mm. put in front of them. And that's why Ukrainian position in terms of international law is, is much stronger one. But there are doubts whether all of the claims which were brought before the court by Ukraine would be upheld as such. For example, the thing which refers to terrorism, as I had mentioned before, mm. Russian Federation says that there is no terrorism when there is ongoing armed conflict yeah yes yeah, so uh, it is like uh, refusing its previous position in terms of uh, what is really going on in Ukraine because th these are two different situations in terms of Crimea of course Russian Federation says that there is no no ongoing armed conflict because it was like a transfer of territory mm -hmm. to Russian Federation through the emanation of self so-called self determination through the sham referendum as far as in, we know uh, in contrast the situation in eastern ukraine is a bit different one of course in terms of affiliation of conduct mm. uh, in order to see the link between the agents which are performing some conduct uh, on behalf of russian federation so there are some tests in order to be applied but uh, whether court will look into the issues or not, I'm not sure, because uh, if we take into account some separate decision, uh, decisions and dissenting opinions and declarations which were disseminated uh, last Friday, we mm. would see that not all of the judges are pretty sure of what to do on the next stage. Yeah. But still, uh, it is ongoing battle. This is the proper fora to handle such issues and Ukraine is uh, showing a good example how to solve uh, disputes in the 21st century, despite Russian Federation, who is uh, seeking every chance in order to cripple other countries. Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much for explaining more about uh, this case. And of course, it's one that we're certainly uh, going to uh, keep an eye on. So thank you very much again for uh, coming into the studio today. That was uh, Taras Simbrovsky. He is the head of USAID Human Rights in Action program. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more here on UATV. Yeah.